In chapter 6, part 2, we'll pick up where we left off by discussing the microscopic anatomy of bone. Uh, we'll take a deeper look at the different cells of bone tissue. Uh, from there, we will move on to the osteon, uh, chemical composition of bone, how the bony skeleton forms, and the necessary steps. Um, and then we'll get into fracture repair and finish up with two different types of bone disorders. In part one of chapter six, we learned that there were three levels of bone anatomy, uh, gross anatomy, microscopic, and chemical anatomy. When looking at the microscopic anatomy of bone, we'll be studying the different cells of bone tissue. Remember that bone is an example of connective tissue, and by definition, any tissue is going to include cells of similar structure and function. In this case, bone tissue includes five different cell types, um, each of which has a different job to contribute to the overall function of bone tissue. We'll talk about each of the five in greater detail, osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, bone lining cells, and osteoclasts. The first type of cell that can be found in osseous tissue is known as an osteogenic stem cell. Uh, you may also see this cell referred to as an osteoprogenitor cell. Overall, these stem cells will be found in the periosteum and endosteum, remember two membranes that surround bone. Um, and when they are stimulated, they will give rise to most all bone cells, like osteoblasts or bone lining cells. The next type of cell is known as an osteoblast. And if you remember uh, from the connective tissue lecture, anything with the term blast at the end refers to an immature cell that is responsible for producing the extracellular matrix for that specific tissue. In this case, Osteoblasts will produce that bone matrix, uh, which we will call osteoid. Uh, the majority of osteoid is collagen as well as calcium binding proteins to give bone its hardness. The next type of cell found in osseous tissue is known as an osteocyte. If you remember, the term site means a mature cell that is there to maintain the health of the matrix. Now what happens is after that osteoblast has secreted so much osteoid, it eventually traps itself inside this hardened shell. Um, and once it's officially trapped within the osteoid, it changes its name to an osteocyte and it's there to maintain the surrounding matrix. Bone lining cells, uh, depending on where they're located, you can change their name accordingly. These will be found within the periosteum and within the endosteum. Uh, within the periosteum, we can call them periosteal cells. And when they are found in the endosteum, we call them endosteal cells. The fifth and final type of cell found in osseous tissue is known as an osteoclast. And this is a bone cell that is not derived from an osteogenic stem cell. It actually comes from a line of blood cells. Um, and the blood cells that are similar to osteoclasts are macrophages. Macrophages uh, utilize phagocytosis, so they engulf large debris and break it down. Osteoclasts are used in bone resorption, so think remodeling, um, breaking down bone. And at the base of these osteoclasts, they have a ruffled border, and that ruffled border is there to, one, secrete enzymes onto bone tissue to break it down, uh, but the ruffled border also allows for increased surface area. Next, when looking at compact bone, you should note that it may also be referred to as lamellar bone. Um, but compact bone, when we studied gross anatomy, was this hard um, external layer of bone that appeared to be solid and smooth. 
but what's actually going on inside of that bone is fairly interesting. Um, compact bone overall will include what is known as the osteon or the haversion system. We will find lots of canals and canaliculi or little canals as well as interstitial and circumferential lamellae. You should know that the osteon or the haversion system is the structural unit of compact bone. Uh, you will see an image here on the next slide, but for now, uh, try to picture maybe a soup can or an elongated cylinder. And these cylinders are going to run parallel really to the diaphysis or to the long axis of the bone. Um, and there are thousands of osteons per bone. Each osteon, uh, similar to a tree, will have rings. Um, and each of these rings is a lamellae. So think of it as another layer or another ring. And within these lamellae, we have collagen fibers that are oriented uh, perpendicular to each other to resist stress as well as twisting of the bone. On this slide here, we are looking at one single osteon. Again, each bone is made up of thousands of osteons. Um, so each osteon will have many lamellae or many layers of collagen fibers running perpendicular to each other. Again, this is the structural unit of bone um, and it allows bone to withstand stress as well as twisting. Looking at the osteon in greater detail, uh, we have many canals and canaliculi, or little canals. All of these provide openings for blood vessels as well as nerve fibers and communication between different structures making up bone tissue. The first canal that you have to know is known as the central or the haversion canal, and this runs right down the center of the osteon. And if you go back to the previous image, um, coming out of that central canal, you find blood vessels as well as nerve fibers. An osteon will also have perforating or Volkmann's canals, and these are running at right angles to that central canal. The purpose of perforating or Volkmann's canals is to allow for neighboring structures to communicate with each other. So an osteon can talk to the next osteon or the osteons can communicate with the medullary cavity as well as the periosteum. We also have what are known as canaliculi. Uh, so making up these lamellae, we have osteocytes trapped in lacuna or hard shells. And coming off of these lacuna look like little spider legs or legs of a centipede, but what they actually are is a canaliculi. Um, and the purpose of these canaliculi is to allow for communication between osteocytes that are adjacent to each other. Here's that term again, lamellae. Again, it means layers or rings. Um, however, these two types of lamellae, interstitial and circumferential, are not a part of the immediate osteon. Interstitial lamellae, think interstitial in between. Interstitial lamellae are remnants of old osteons, um, or they are going to be the beginnings of bone remodeling or new osteons. The other type of lamellae is known as a circumferential lamellae, um, and these layers or these rings are just deep uh, to the periosteum, and again, they make up that outer uh, perimeter of compact bone. On this slide here, uh, you have a cut from a long bone, so maybe think the humerus. Either way, I'm able to pick out one, two, three, four, five, maybe eight individual osteons. And again, a single osteon will include the melee or layers of collagen fibers a central canal, and many perforating or Volkmann's canals. You are able to see um, on this diagram that a perforating or Volkmann's canal allows for communication between 
other areas within that bone and the central cavity or the central canal of osteons. Be sure to note interstitial lamellae, so lamellae located in between adjacent osteons, as well as circumferential lamellae. Again, circumferential lamellae will uh, span the entire circumference of the diaphysis of long bones. Everything that we have talked about um, up until right now has been about the osteon and the cells, but you should note that osteons are only present in compact bone. They are the structural unit of compact bone. Now, remember, we can also look at spongy bone. Uh, so lots of trabeculae and passageways for red and yellow marrow. There are no osteons associated with spongy bone. However, we still have lamellae and osteocytes that are allowed to communicate with each other utilizing canaliculi. The last structural level in which we can look at bone in part one, we discussed uh, the growth of cartilage and how we have appositional and interstitial growth of cartilage. Uh, moving away from cartilage and uh, looking at the process of osseous tissue formation um, is known as osteogenesis or ossification. Um, and again, this will be where bone tissue replaces that skeletal cartilage. Uh, but you should note that bone remodeling and repair lasts an entire lifetime. Um, and we get a new skeleton X amount of times throughout our entire life. As I previously mentioned, um, during development, uh, our skeleton is actually skeletal cartilage, which mostly resembles hyaline cartilage. It's rich in water. It contains chondrocytes. It's also avascular and lacks nerve fibers. But what happens as we develop, um, this skeletal cartilage is replaced with bone tissue. It's not the hardening of cartilage, that's something else. We actually have bone cells infiltrate this cartilage to lay down bone tissue. We have two different types of bone development endochondral ossification, and intramembranous. Again, that term chondro or chondral means cartilage. Uh, so during endochondral ossification, we will see that bones are formed by replacing that skeletal cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage. Um, and the majority of the bones that make up the skeleton are formed this way. The other type of ossification, intramembranous, uh, so think membrane. The bones that grow this way uh, come from a fibrous membrane, and most of the bones superior to the clavicle, so think the skull, uh, will develop via intramembranous ossification. We will go uh, into detail with endochondral ossification and not so much with intramembranous, uh, but for either one, you should note that again, ossification is not the hardening of cartilage, but rather the replacement of cartilage with bone tissue. Um, when looking at endochondral ossification, we have five main steps. Um, but prior to those steps starting, uh, we have this primary ossification center. And as its name suggests, that's where we will see the development of bone begin. Um, it's located in the center of the diaphysis. Um, and we will see what's called a bud invade this center and bring in with it blood vessels and bone cells uh, to begin to lay down that matrix. Again, endochondral ossification involves five main steps, and on the next slide you will see a schematic of each step. Uh, but for now, if you think that you have a bone, but it's mostly cartilage, so a cartilage bone, um, the first thing that will happen is a bone collar will form around the diaphysis of the cartilage skeleton.
from there, the central cartilage in the shaft is going to calcify, so it's going to harden. And after it does, we will eventually see um, cavities begin to appear, so openings. Step three, we have this bud, this periosteal bud that is going to bring in with it blood vessels, nerves, um, bone cells, as well as red bone marrow. It's going to invade the cavity that we just saw created from the calcified cartilage. Um, and this bud will lead to ultimately the formation of spongy bone. Next, uh, we begin to see the diaphysis or the shaft lengthen and the formation of the medullary cavity. Again, that medullary cavity is only present in long bones. It's where we see yellow bone marrow. While all this is happening, we see the secondary ossification centers appear in the bone ends, so the proximal and distal epiphyses. Eventually, the epiphyses will ossify or will have bone tissue laid down, and the only places where we will see hyaline cartilage remaining from that skeleton are in the growth plate as well as the articular cartilage covering the ends of that bone. Here's the schematic of the five main steps uh, involved in the process of endochondral ossification. Again, this type of bone growth occurs in the majority of the bones of the skeleton, um, especially long bones, which is what we are seeing here. So the very first thing that happens, uh, we have that primary ossification center in the diaphysis, but we see the development of a bone collar. Eventually, the cartilage in that primary ossification center will calcify and erode or develop cavities. From there, we are able to bring in this periosteal bud, which is carrying many different types of structures that will contribute to the overall development of bone tissue. From there, we see spongy bone begin to form. But remember, within the diaphysis, we don't have spongy bone. So we need to eventually create a medullary cavity from that, which is what we see happen in step four. The diaphysis will begin to lengthen, and that is where we see the development of the medullary cavity for yellow bone marrow. All while this is happening, uh, we have secondary ossification centers appear in the epiphyses, or the ends. That is where we will have spongy bone develop deep to compact bone. And then eventually the only places where we have hyaline cartilage left will be in the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate and covering the epiphyses where we will form joints or articulations. The other type of ossification uh, is known as intramembranous ossification, and you should note that intramembranous ossification will give rise to bones uh, superior to the clavicle or to the collarbone, such as the skull. Uh, four main steps, I would mostly focus on endochondral ossification rather than intramembranous. Uh, but either way, we will still see ossification centers um, being formed. Uh, we have these different types of cells known as mesenchymal cells, which are seen in the fetus and during embryological development. Those mesenchymal cells will differentiate into osteoblasts, immature bone cells that will secrete the extracellular matrix, known as osteoid. So osteoid is eventually secreted by the osteoblasts, and then it hardens. And when it hardens, it forms woven bone. Woven bone is immature bone. Um, but this bone is being laid down around already existing blood vessels, which is where we see all of those pores come from in spongy bone. Lastly, lamellar or mature bone will replace that woven bone, and we will see this hematopoietic tissue or this red bone marrow appear. Here are the four steps if you prefer images, uh, but first we have an ossification center. The cells that you see there are mesenchymal cells. 
mesenchymal cells will eventually differentiate into the orange cells, which are osteoblasts. In step two, those osteoblasts will begin to secrete osteoid. And eventually when they kind of trap themselves in and they're surrounded by osteoid, they become osteocytes or mature bone cells. Next, um, that bone that has been laid down is known as woven bone and it's immature bone, but it's laid down around blood vessels, which results in trabeculae. And then lastly, lamellar or mature bone will replace that woven bone and we begin to see the appearance of red matter. So we have just finished discussing how bone tissue replaces the skeletal cartilage that we are developed with. Um, but now we're gonna shift gears and talk about um, how our long bones lengthen or growth in length of long bones. And going back to the two types of cartilage growth, um, appositional and interstitial, this is where interstitial growth will take place. Interstitial growth is where we have the growth of cartilage deep in the bone, which ultimately results in the lengthening. So we're going to take a close-up look at the epiphyseal plate, or that plate of hyaline cartilage which separates the diaphysis from the epiphysis. There are five zones. Um, each zone has something a little bit different going on from the other ones. Uh, so you should know the order in which the zones occur, as well as a little bit about each of them. We have the resting zone, proliferation zone, hypertrophic zone, calcification zone, and lastly, the ossification zone. The resting zone, as its name suggests, is relatively quiet. There's not much going on here. Um, but it's going to be um, a layer of cartilage on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate. So out of the five zones, this one you could think of as at the top or at the very bottom, depending on which end of the bone you are talking about. But this is the zone that is closest to the epiphysis or to the end of the bone. As you begin to move towards the diaphysis, you reach the proliferation zone. And again, all of these zones are cells of cartilage. Again, interstitial growth is the growth of cartilage, which pushes the bone away from each other, resulting in the lengthening. Within the proliferation zone, we start to see chondrocytes that are rapidly dividing. Um, and these new cells are going to be moved upward, or they're going to push upward, thereby lengthening the bone. Next, we have the hypertrophic zone, and the term hypertrophy means an increase in size. So we will begin to see these cartilage cells, or chondrocytes, increase and eventually erode. Um, and by eroding, they're going to form spaces. Next, we have the calcification zone. And again, calcified cartilage is hardened cartilage. Um, it is not the same as bone. But within the calcification zone, we see these cartilage cells die and eventually deteriorate. And the last zone, the ossification zone, is after these chondrocytes deteriorate and they're gone, um, they're going to be replaced by osteoblasts. And we know that osteoblasts secrete osteoid or they lay down the extracellular matrix of bone. And eventually we will see spongy bone appear as well as the medullary cavity enlarge. If you're having a hard time uh, trying to picture these five zones, this is a histological section. Uh, so it's a microscopic view of the epiphyseal plate. Um, and it looks like it's taken maybe from the humerus. So use that little bone up in the left-hand corner as reference. But remember, at the very top, closest to the epiphysis is the resting zone. So not much going on there. 
Next, we're moving our way towards the diaphysis. We see the proliferation zone. So these chondrocytes rapidly divide or proliferate. Deep to that, working our way down further, we have the hypertrophic zone. These cells increase in size, they puff up. Next, these cartilage cells will calcify or harden and eventually die and deteriorate, allowing for interconnecting spaces which we see in spongy bone. And then lastly, we have the ossification zone um, where those osteoblasts are actively secreting osteoid to create bone tissue. Eventually, our long bones stop lengthening. Uh, so near the end of adolescence, um, it's usually between the ages of 18 and 21 years old is where we see um, the activity in the epiphyseal plate decline. Eventually, when that epiphyseal plate um, shows no more cartilage and we see the fusion of the epiphysis with the diaphysis, we call it the epiphyseal line. So epiphyseal plate, think growth plate, active cartilage, epiphyseal line is where that plate is completely ossified and we have no more lengthening. We're going to shift gears again um, and begin to focus on how we remodel um, bone as well as how we resorb it or break it down. Um, and bone remodeling will include a healthy balance between osteoblasts and bone deposit as well as osteoclasts and bone resorption. Um, these two cells, when packaged together, are considered a remodeling unit. So one will lay down the extracellular matrix and one will break it down and sweep it up. As mentioned earlier, uh, the fifth and final cell of bone tissue is known as an osteoclast. Osteoclasts are responsible for breaking down bone, uh, which is necessary in remodeling, but also necessary for maintaining blood calcium levels. What this osteoclast does is it's going to dig a depression or a groove with that ruffled border. It's actively secreting enzymes as well as protons to break down bony matrix. And when it does that, it takes that broken down bone and sweeps it up inside of it to digest it or break it down. Osteoclasts are also involved in um, phagocytizing or engulfing and digesting broken down matrix as well as dead bone cells, which are osteocytes. Once it has all of this debris inside of the cell, it's going to release it into the surrounding fluid and then into the bloodstream. In order to activate this cell, because we don't want this cell active all the time, uh, we are going to discuss a hormone known as parathyroid hormone, uh, which can also be shortened to PTH. Bone remodeling is constantly occurring. Like I said, we get a new skeleton X amount of times throughout our life, um, but there are two important things that you need to know in response to remodeling and resorption. Um, number one is the big one that you have to know, hormonal controls. Um, and this involves a negative feedback loop involving blood calcium levels. And calcium is extremely important um, in many different processes of the human body, such as muscle contraction, which we will see next unit, um, nerve transmission, as well as blood coagulation or the formation of blood clots. The other factor uh, that plays a role in bone remodeling and resorption is bone's response to mechanical stress. We are constantly pulling on our bones, we are putting weight on them, um, and so our bones will respond to the demands placed on them by remodeling or growing or resorbing. With regards to the two factors that play a role in remodeling and resorption, you absolutely need to understand the hormonal control. 
and the two hormones that are involved in bone resorption um, will be parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Our variable here is blood calcium levels. So if our blood calcium levels drop, that will stimulate the osteoclast activity to resorb bone. And the whole reason these two things are interconnected is because calcium is a primary constituent of bone tissue. So blood calcium levels drop, which will stimulate osteoclast activity. Osteoclasts will break down bone and release that calcium back into the bloodstream, bringing blood calcium levels back up to a homeostatic level. Now again, this is a negative feedback loop. So when we reach that level that we want to be at, we turn down the system or we turn it off. The other hormone involved in blood calcium levels is known as calcitonin. And you should think that calcitonin is released in response to high blood calcium levels. Calcitonin is used to tone blood calcium levels down. Here we have our teeter-totter again uh, when we look at homeostasis as well as uh, negative feedback loops. So on the teeter-totter, we have blood calcium levels. If we go clockwise, we begin to see that teeter-totter drop. We have a decline in blood calcium levels. That will stimulate the release of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid glands, which are located in the neck. Parathyroid hormone will communicate to the osteoclast to increase their activity because their activity is breaking down bone and releasing that calcium from bone back into the bloodstream. And as we allow that calcium to enter the bloodstream, we bring our teeter-totter back up to a stable level, to a homeostatic level. We're going to finish up this lecture by talking about fracture repair um, as well as a couple of bone disorders. Um, but to start, anytime there's a fracture, that means there is a break. Um, that could be an incomplete break or it could be a complete break of the bone. Usually in children or young adults, um, fractures will come from trauma. Um, and then old age or even adults, um, fractures in that age group can result from bone weakness or bone thinning. Once you have a fracture, there are four steps um, involved in the repair. Hematoma formation, fibrocartilaginous callus formation, bony callus formation, and bone remodeling. You should know the steps in the order in which they occur as well as what is really happening in that step to contribute to repair of a fracture. The formation of a hematoma. So hematoma, again, heme or hemat means blood. When a bone breaks, what also breaks is the blood vessels that are coursing through it and surround it or surrounding it. And when that happens, those blood vessels will hemorrhage or bleed out, eventually forming this mass of clotted blood known as a hematoma. Afterwards, uh, we have the development of a fibrocartilaginous callus. So into that hematoma, we have teeny tiny blood vessels known as capillaries. These capillaries are allowing for the transport of phagocytes, um, fibroblasts, as well as bone cells into that area um, of the fracture. The capillaries will bring in fibroblasts. Remember, a fibroblast is an immature cell found in connective tissue that will secrete collagen. Fibroblasts are trying to connect or bridge together the broken ends of the bone. We also have cartilage in there and osteogenic cells, remember, stem cells, um, that will contribute to the reconstruction of bone. Afterwards, um, after we bring in those capillaries, if you require a diagram, uh, this slide is for you, but this will show you the four major steps involved in fracture repair. 
Again, step one, we have the formation of a hematoma. So when you break the bone, you also break the blood vessels coursing through it, which leads to a bleeding out and the formation of a large blood clot. Step two, uh, we have the infiltration of capillaries, which bring in bone cells and fibroblasts as well as cartilage to clear out the debris, but also to begin to lay down collagen to bridge the gap and also bone cells to lay down osteoid. Eventually, uh, step three rolls around and when so much osteoid is secreted, we have the formation of a bony callus. Um, so we have some excess bone inside as well as some excess bone on the external surface. Lastly, we want to remodel that bone using osteoclasts so that it resembles its original structure. Lastly, we will address um, a couple of clinical correlations, uh, bone disorders. So Anytime there's a bone disorder, uh, whether it's the two listed below, osteomalacia or osteoporosis, or anything else like rickets disease, um, osteoarthritis, it usually results from an imbalance between the deposit of bone tissue and the resorption of bone tissue. The two that we will talk about, as I just said, will be osteomalacia and osteoporosis. Osteomalacia, you should think soft or malleable. Uh, so in a patient who has osteomalacia, their bones are soft and therefore they are weak. Um, this is because the bones are poorly mineralized. They lack those calcium and phosphorus salts that contribute to the hardness of bone. Um, the osteoblasts are laying down osteoid, but the calcium salts and phosphorus salts are not there to provide the hardness. Next, osteoporosis, which is extremely common these days. Um, the matrix is normal. Uh, there are calcium salts, but there is a decline in the overall mass of bone. Um, and on the next slide, we will actually see um, a microscopic view of osteoporotic bone compared to healthy bone. But overall, in osteoporosis, this is where the breakdown of bone exceeds the deposit, which is why we have a decline in the mass. On the top, or A, uh, you have normal bone, and then on the bottom, you have osteoporotic bone. Again, the breakdown of bone exceeds the deposit, so something's wrong with the osteoclast and osteoblast activity but there are several factors that can contribute to this disease. Overall, the typical risk factors, uh, we see osteoporosis in postmenopausal women, and that is due to low estrogen levels. Um, but a poor diet, uh, lack of exercise, as well as smoking can also contribute to osteoporosis. In order to treat or simply prevent it, um, a patient would want to focus on weight-bearing exercises as well as maybe supplementing with calcium and vitamin D. To summarize Chapter 6, Part 2, uh, we covered the microscopic anatomy of bone as well as the chemical composition of bone. We address the uh, formation of the bony skeleton, also known as ossification. We then moved into the epiphyseal plate, all of its parts and pieces, and then finished up with the repair of a fracture as well as bone disorders.